We okay? Might be a big blind dog. I don't know. I left my glasses in my other purse. And so I'm borrowing John's eyes tonight, so we'll see. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, they're not that bad. Actually, John, I can see them, seriously, so I think we should be okay. Well, praise the Lord. Today I was telling the pastor real quick that John and I went out to church and we dropped off some uh, Christmas presents, some of those kids from Wrapped in Love, Pastor Badama's um, little program. And, you know, we're supposed to bless the kids, but it was an amazing time at the one parent's house. Like, John and I got really, really blessed. We really did. Yeah, so um, if you've never done it, I would urge you and suggest to do it at least one time. You'd be surprised. Um, the outcome, it's, I was very surprised today. Um, it, was very, it was very humbling, and it was very emotional, but it was a very, very good time. And um, pray for, uh, the girl's name is Tanya, and the other girl's name is Adriana. Pray for them, and we'll see what happens with the Lord, because um, she, she was really eager today, and she asked a whole bunch of questions, so we ministered, and it was really good, wasn't it? We got blessed. Praise the Lord. I'm going to thank my pastor, as always, but especially tonight, and I don't want to cry because I don't have a Kleenex on, but I cried already today, but I want to thank the pastor, especially tonight, because he has faith in his, in his sheep. He really does, and I really appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll tell you real quick, on December 6th was our Christmas party, and the pastor had come over and he said, hey, I have two nights left over, 21st and 28th. And I said, well, I, I really can't do either because my nephew turns 13 on the 21st. There's a big birthday party, and then the 28th will be in Hershey with the folks. And so he didn't say anything, and, you know, we'd have to go with that. He's not a taskmaster. He doesn't like, you know, whip you. Sunday, so Sunday, well, he doesn't whip me. <laughs> I must be a good sheep. He doesn't whip me. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so on um, the, so Sunday morning, December 7th, I got up, plugged my tree, and put my coffee on. I was doing some devotions, and I hopped in the shower, and the Lord decided to meet me there. And um, he told me all about my silly old self. And right smack dab in the middle of the shower, he brought up a good deed that I had done for him, in 1992, before I was even saved. And the guy's name was Bob Daugherty. If I forget before we close tonight, just say, hey, what about Bob Daugherty, okay? Because I might get caught up and just forget about it. But he reminded me of Bob Daugherty, and right smack dab in my shower, he said to me, um, you know, you've been late to other birthday parties, and what's one more? And I just, when he said that to me, I knew it was his voice. When, I, when he said it to me, I, I just began to cry, and I was like, you know, you know, Lord, you're right, and I don't know who do I think I am. You know, you, you give me gifts, and, and you give me anointing, and I'm going to a birthday party. I tell my pastor, no. And, you know, he just, he just really, really lovingly chastised me. So I get out of the shower, and John's saying something. I said, just hold up, because after he chastised me, he gave me the word for tonight. I've been chomping since December 7th. So thank God for this little hand-free thing, because we're going to talk tonight. But as soon as I come up out of the shower, John was like saying something. I said, just stop because the Lord's blasting in my ear all this stuff about tonight. And I said, I've got to text the pastor. I've got to tell him whatever. So I text the pastor. I say, Pastor, if December 21st is still on, I'm available. And what do you think he writes back to me? He goes, you're in, big dog. <laughs> I, started, I started to cry again. And I said, yeah, well, ha ha, the Lord decided to meet this big dog in her shower and tell her all about her sorry little self. But I do thank you, Pastor. You know how much I love you, and I really appreciate you, because you're like a little pusher sometimes when I need that little nudge, and I appreciate that. So extra special tonight for you. Tonight we're going to talk about Christmas, and if the pastor would have said one more scripture, I'd be like, okay, well, here's my notes, because he did like half my message tonight. But we're going to be okay. It's Christmas. We're going to talk about Christmas because it is Christmas, but we're going to talk about Easter, too, because Christmas uh, really is all about Easter, and then we're going to talk about New Year's because Christmas and Easter really is about New Year's, a fresh start, new life, new day, and Jesus is all about new. 
So um, we're going to pray, and we're going to see where he leads us. And if I had to, when I was writing in my journal, and I'm like, Lord, well, you know, what should I call this? And I just said, the reason for the season, with a question mark, Jesus, born to die, because that's why he was born. He was born to die for us. So let's pray, and we'll see what happens with the Lord after that. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for who you are, Lord God. I thank you that in this busy season, and we've all been busy with different things and different uh, functions and events, Lord, but tonight we come before you. Uh, we're very, very needy people, God. We are very much in need of you tonight. We're in, in need of you of a new word and a fresh word, Lord, and we just need to hear from you. But most importantly, Lord, we need to sense your presence around us. And so I would ask, Father, that you would come and hide me first behind your cross, that the people here would only see and hear you, Lord, because you are most important. You're the one who died for us, and you reign supreme. We are just vessels for you to use, God. I ask you would do that. Would you come, Lord, by your spirit? And God, would you rest upon each one of us? Would you open up our hearts and open up our minds to hear spiritually what you would have for us tonight, Lord? And in this busy, busy season, would you just soften our minds and just relax our spirits, God, and just help us to turn everything over to you for the next little bit of time that we have together, Lord, that we just honor you and worship you and uh, just glorify you because you are so worthy of it all. We love you. We praise you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, well, let's start with Christmas. Let's read the prophecy. So if you have your Bibles, go to Isaiah. Uh, we'll start with chapter 9. Uh, they gave us a new, some kind of new template for this Kindle, and it's not agreeing with me, but we'll be all right. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 9. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment, I think King James says the zeal, of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Go to Isaiah 7. And verse 14. We there? Here's the prophecy. All right, then the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. That's the prophecy, Jesus' birth. Now, if you go to Matthew, we're going to jump around a little bit tonight, but we'll be okay. We're going to read a little bit. We're going to jump a little bit. But we're going to put this out for the Lord. Go to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to see where this is fulfilled. Start with verse 18. We'll do some reading. We all there? Matthew 1, verse 18. Good? This is how Jesus... The, I'm reading the New Living Testament. I think the guys have King James up there. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place... While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And he's, he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When, Jesus woke, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. He did not have relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Verse 19 says, um, no, go to Luke. I want to start, I want to go there next. Luke chapter 2. That's what we'll do. Luke chapter 2, second part of the Christmas story. We're going to read a little bit. 
At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census, and because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took Mary with him, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging for him at the inn. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. The Savior, the Messiah of the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in a manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everything and everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' stories were astonished. 19. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. Stop right there for a second. Everything the shepherds were saying, and all, even all the gifts the wise men had brought, the Bible says Mary pondered all those things in her heart. And I wrote this down. I don't think at this time in her life, Mary knew what was going to happen to her son. Now, she knew the Lord had told her that she was going to deliver a child, it was going to be his child, but I don't really think Mary knew, like, exactly who she was delivering. And I wrote, she knew he was special, and she knew he was from God, but she didn't know. She didn't know everything her son was going to go through. Now, continue in 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, this is verse 21. When the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel, even before he was conceived. You know, that's funny because today when I was talking to Adriana, her mother had asked me a question about having children and things like that and whatnot. And I said to her, listen, uh, God knew before you even had Adriana that you were going to have her. And I looked straight at Adriana and I said, God knew your name before your mother knew. And I gave her some scripture. I said in the Bible, in Psalms 139, David said, before I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. So Adriana, before you were even in your mother's womb, God knew you. He even knew what he was going to tell your mother to name you. He knew you 2,000 years ago, and I was able to give her a couple of verses to that song we sing, um, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I told her that, and I said, he knew your name before you were in your mother's womb. Uh, okay, so where was I? Yeah, okay, 22. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. 24. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young uh, pigeons. Verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple, so when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, he took, Simeon was there, he took the child in his arms, praised God, and said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, 
which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. 33. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. See, again, they marveled at all the things that were said about their son, but they, they didn't know. They, they truly didn't know. But Simeon knew. Simeon knew exactly who he was, because then Simeon says this in 34. Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. I believe that sword pierced her soul at the cross when her son died. Because between the time of her, his birth and his death, there were things that were going on that she knew. She knew at the wedding of Cana. She told the people, do what he said. So she might not have fully comprehended, and she might have learned along the way, as we do. You know, I'm learning who he is every single day. You know, I haven't arrived. I, I don't know everything about him, but I sure know more now than I did in 1996 because I'm growing in him. Well, Mary didn't know everything, but she, she knew eventually, and I believe that the sword, the prophecy he gave Mary was whenever he died at the cross. And I wrote, Simeon knew exactly what this child was all about because God had told him. And he knew that Jesus' death would pierce his mother's soul. Let me see if I can find it here. I think I brought it with me. Yeah. You know who Chris Tomlin is? We all know Chris Tomlin? Yeah. He has a song called Born That We May Have Life. Check out these words. A throne in a manger, the cross in a cradle, the hidden revealing the glorious plan of a child who would suffer, a child who would conquer, the sin of every woman, the sin of every man. Don't tell me he wasn't born to die. He was born to die. He sings, Rejoice, O world, your Savior has come through the love of a virgin's womb. Son of God, Son of Man, born that we may have life. He was born that I might have life. Reason for the season? Jesus, born to die. Turn to um, Isaiah. Let's talk a little bit about Easter. Turn to Isaiah 53. We'll start there a little bit. <laughs> Ladies, it's funny because I was up here just now looking at my thing, and I said, let's turn, and I almost said, anybody have any comments they want to share? <laughs> Isaiah 53, verse 1. <laughs> um, we'll read verse 1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open up his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he die without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, verse 9, and he had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, verse 10. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. 
When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many, and he interceded for rebels. It pleased the father to bruise his son. Even when we went astray. How many went astray? Abby, me too. Even when I went astray and did my own thing, it pleased the father to bruise his son because he knew what I was going to do. He knew it way back then. But when I humbled myself, he humbled me. And I was able to come to him. He, I, that brought him praise. That brought him glory that we humbled ourselves and gave our lives over to him. But it pleased him to bruise his son for me. Oh, let's see. Please God to reconcile everything to himself. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Uh -oh, something happened here. Okay, here we go. Go to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to start at 15. This is Paul talking. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything and in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Verse 17. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. 18. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is first in everything. Verse 19. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood, on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I wrote here, it pleased God to reconcile everything to himself, and he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Everything, everything, that includes us. We're holy and blameless now because of what he did then. Verse 23. We're still in Colossians 1. We still there? Okay. Verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance that you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. You have to continue. I have to continue. I don't get saved. Memorial Day of 1996, and then go about my business the rest of the time and expect to remain saved or at least in right standing with the Lord. I, don't, I can't do that. I can't grow if I don't continue every single day, every single month, every single year. Stand firm. You've got to continue to believe today and in the future, which takes us to New Year's. Now, I want to go to John, and I'm going to go to chapter 17. And let me tell you folks, if you've never read, I'm sure you all have read John 17 sometime in your Christian walk, but if you've never read John 17, read it. Sit in your little closet, have a cup of coffee, be real quiet, and read it. And I'm telling you, man, it will blow you away. The first time I read this, I was just newly, newly saved a couple days. And he gave me this scripture, and I was literally on the floor. 
I was on the floor in tears because it was amazing to find out what John 17 has to say. Well, let me pull it up first because I decided to go to John 1. Whatever, Cheryl. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right. Now, we're going to read John 17 because before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed for us. He prayed for the, his disciples then, and he prayed for us today. And this is what he says. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. Verse 3. And this is the way you have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Verse 5. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, they know everything I have is a gift from you. Verse 8, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it, and they know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. Verse 9, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. 10, all who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your... This is Jesus praying. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Twelve. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that no one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Stop right there for a second. You know, whenever you're out in the world... You can talk about God, talk about God all you want. God this, God that, God this, God that. God does this, God said that. You can talk about Buddha, 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 Buddha. You can talk about Allah. You can do Allah over here. You can talk about Allah over there. You can have little uh, musicals about Allah. You can have anything you want. You say Jesus' name and you can't do anything. You can't even mention him in the public square. You can't even have a star on a Christmas tree. You can't even have a Christmas tree anymore in the schools because that's a little bit towards Christmas, Christ miss. You, you say Jesus' name, mm -hmm, and uh, you won't get too far. Name above every name, Pastor. You're absolutely right. And at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. There are people talking about Buddha. Those people trying to tell us we can't say this and we can't say that. And we can't go here and we can't go there. You know what? Where's that camera? Your knee's going to bow. Their knees going to bow. Oh, you're going to confess his name. You don't want to confess him now. You're going to confess him over then. It's going to be too late for you then. But you will confess his name. Because his name is everything. Where was I? I get a little bit lost here. Okay, here we go. Verse 13. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in the world so that they would be filled with my joy. 14. I have given them your word and the world hates them. Because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. You don't belong to the world anymore. I don't belong in the world anymore. We're in the world. We're not of the world. We've got to work there. We've got to shop there. We've got to live there. We've got to eat there. We are not of this world. Not one single bit. And if you haven't noticed recently, as you get closer to the Lord Jesus, and you grow a little bit stronger... You get out there and you start acting a little bit like them, because sometimes this little sheep here tends to do that, I confess. Okay? You will know right away. The spirit inside of me does not tarry with that too long before he tells me, a little girl, come on over, you're wavering a little bit. You try that. You try acting one little bit. Mm -hmm. And it, it won't work. It won't work. The spirit in you, the spirit in you, and the spirit in me does not like us being anything like the world. And I don't, I don't remember who I told this to. I was talking to somebody, I forget now, but I said, oh, we were at coffee one day at Panera. And uh, one of the guys had said something kind of sharp to me, and it kind of hacked me off a little bit. And I had a small little word for him, but I kept it to myself because I really wanted to blast him with it, but I didn't. But all I said to him was, you know, what you just said to me now, you better look right here 
Even look right here, because the Jesus I worship, he's right here next to me. How do you feel about saying that to me now? That's what I said to him. I wanted to blast him, but I think maybe I did blast him with what I said to him. But, you know, I said it kind of light. I didn't like, you know, really, I didn't bulletize. I didn't bulletize it. I didn't. But I let him know, I let him know that, you know what, you can't say these things. If you, if you know that I'm a Christian and you believe I'm a Christian and I act like I'm a Christian, then you can't talk like that because I brought him with me. Sorry to tell you, I brought him with me. You asked me here for coffee, he came along with me. So you've got to watch what you say. Yeah, that's right. Ain't that right? Don't you feel that way too? You know it's the truth. They know it's the truth too. Okay, where was I at? 14. And the world, okay. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. 15. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. 16. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. This is Jesus praying for his disciples, and he's praying for us. You don't believe me? Hang on a couple more verses. 18. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. That's us. Okay? I can't be a pew sitter. Sometimes I want to be. You all know that story. I can't be. You can't be a pew sitter. You may want to be. You can't be. You've got to be about your father's business. A little bit too dark out there in the world to be alone without him. We've got unsaved loved ones. I can't be a pew sitter. Can't do it. I am sending them into the world, he said. Verse 19. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they could be made holy by your truth. Now here we go. Verse 20. Who didn't believe me when I said he's praying for us? All right. Better believe me because here we go. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe in you. Check it out, there's more. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and they in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Hallelujah. He prayed for me 2,000 years ago. My name is in this little scripture we just read. Father, he goes on. Wait, am I missing my little notes here? I uh, told you that one. Okay, here we go. The future looks bleak for the unbeliever, but not for us. Because he's given us a hope, he's given us a future, and he's given us dreams. We're going on to, uh, where are we at here? 23. I am in them, and you are in me, and may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Let me stop and tell you something real quick. There was a little tiny wall that me and a friend of mine had kind of built up between us. Not a real big one, but big enough to cause a little issue. Well, we got together, we got together one night, and we kind of hashed it out, and we kind of settled it. And we prayed, and uh, we come to realize that that wall, well, shouldn't have been there. And we prayed, and we, the Lord knocked that wall down, and so now... When I see my friend and my friend sees me, we hug and we love and we say, hey. And when we have an issue and the Lord all of a sudden puts me on my friend's heart and I get a text. Hey, just thinking about you this morning. Have a good day. And I'm thinking to myself, holy moly, Lord, thank you because right now it's a hell of a day. And you send my name to her and her spirit and uh, she, she's praying for me. Okay? And then I see her, and I say, hey, and she looks a little bit forlorn, and I say, hey, what's up? And uh, I pray for her, because the Lord knocked the wall down. You know what you call that? We call that unity. And so now, I said to my friend, you know what? Things are going to happen now. Things are going to grow. Things are going to bloom. 
because we knocked that wall down, we kept the devil aside, and now we're walking in the Lord's way, walking in his path. He made the path straight. We made it crooked. We don't know how. We don't care how. It was crooked and now it's straight. That's unity. We need unity. If you've got an issue with me, take me aside and tell me. I've got an issue with you. We'll pray about it. If I have to, I'll apologize. And if you have to, I'll make you apologize too. But we're going to work it out. Okay? We're, we're a family. Us ladies, in, in our Bible studies, we're doing it. We're, we're doing it. It's, it's like it's one unit. And when one hurts, we're all hurt. When one is rejoicing, we're all rejoicing. And we're all letting our hair down. And we're all sharing. We're all in the same page. And it's really weird because we'll say something and somebody over the other corner will say, oh, I just thought about that. Because it's called unity. And we're working in unity. We're going to be in unity. That's what the Lord wants. He just said it. Where am I at? Because now I'm getting a little bit a little excited here. Okay. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Well, I don't know if the world knows that me and my friend tore that wall down, but me and my friend know we tore that wall down, and we're good with that. Verse 24, Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Verse 25, O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. And then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. He prayed for me way back then, and he's praying for you way back then. We got a hope, we got a future, and we got dreams. Just the other night, I think it was Wednesday, Bible study, Pastor had said something about, you know, he was praying about some things for the near future, for next year, and all that. Those are called dreams. Dreams. What was the dream? You had a dream? How about for our church? Got a dream? Okay, well, I got some dreams too. I got three specific ones I've been praying about. I wasn't going to say what they were because I thought, well, Lord, what if somebody's praying against them? Then you won't know what, answer, what prayer to answer, but I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to say them anyways. My first dream, Lord, we need a flat church. We need a flat church with no steps. I don't care where it's at. We need a flat church with no steps. You know, sometimes we're getting older. I'm 55. I'm getting older. I got a bad knee sometimes. We need, we need a flat church, and I'm praying for that. I also want to see wheelchair accessible vans. Not a van. Not just a van or just one wheelchair van. I want a wheelchair accessible van for all the Bob Dockerties. <laughs> and all the Matthew Butlers that this world has for us to minister to. Now let me tell you who Bob Dockerty is. First of all, you all know who Matthew Butler is. Matthew Butler is pastor's nephew. And I happened to drive him when he was in the IU school in 1993 and 1994. That's how far back we go. Well, Bob Dockerty, in 1992, I wasn't even saved. I was a home health aide and driving a school bus. And I had gone down to the high rise, I think, where your high rise is, Cindy. Or maybe the one in Arnold. The one in Arnold. And there was a guy named Bob Dockerty. He had cerebral palsy. And um, he was just, he was probably about 60 years old. And he couldn't get out a whole lot. He was in a wheelchair. And pretty much by that time, he was bound in a wheelchair. But one Christmas Eve, I said to him, hey, the Gospel Tabernacle up on Freeport Road, we all know there's real life assembly, they're having Christmas Eve service. Do you want to go? Yeah. See, he would love when I'd come because I'd put on that WJAS, the 40s channel on, on AM, and I like the big band music too, so we'd just listen to it and I'd cook for him. I'd make all this bad stuff for him. His sister wouldn't let him eat it, but I, I, I let him eat it. So anyways, so I said, Bob Dockerty, I'm going to take you to church on Christmas Eve. And so I went down in my car. I wasn't even saved. Went down in my car. This is what the Lord reminded me on December 7th. I don't know why. Well, I do know now why. Because I'm going to pray about that. I'm going to wheelchair accessible van for my church. Anyhow, I go and I say, Bob Dockery, I'm taking you to church on Christmas Eve service. He said, okay. So I went to the Goodwill store. I bought a nice little red shirt with a nice little tie. Threw his wheelchair in my car. Threw him in my car. And took him up to the top of the hill. Christmas Eve service. I want to see all the Bob Dockerties, all the Matthew Butlers in my church for every service, including Christmas Eve. We need a flat church people. You've got to pray about that. And we need wheelchair accessible vans for that. 
That's what we need in this church. That's my dream. Anybody else got that dream? Okay, amen. Dream number three. We're almost done. Dream number three. Lord, I want a room in the corner of this church that I can call it the Cafe Cornerstone because I want fellowship. After fellowship. After, oh sis, we have it here. Oh yeah, we have it. Come on back, we have it. After the pilgrimage, me and John and Leo and Fran and Chuck and Sandy, we went to Eaton Park. We shut the place down at midnight. If they were open past midnight, would have still been there because we did the yeah, yeah thing. We were all chatting and getting along and getting to know each other because I don't think Chuck and Sandy knew Fran and Leo too much. Well, they do now. And so he's forming us all together. Well, if we had a cafe cornerstone, you could go and hang out down there anytime you wanted. You want a cup of coffee after Wednesday night service? Come on down to the cafe cornerstone because we have it open. That's what I'm praying for. That's an arm of fellowship. That's how you get to know people. It's relationships. That's where my heart is. My heart is for fellowship. That's why John and I love to do these things. And it really blesses us when you guys all sign up. We're like, yeah, we take this. Now we're going to do Valentine's Day dinner with friends. If anybody's invited, you don't got to be married. You don't got to have a spouse. Oh, yes, Miss Jane's there. You'll see her. She'll have that little Valentine's Day tear on her head, her and Miss Leo, you know. <laughs> but... But that's the dreams for the future. That's how you get unity. You know, that's how you get togetherness. And that's how you get love. And that's how whenever I have a need, I can trust my friend Karen and say, I have a need, can you pray? She'll know, because she knows me, and the Lord knows that she knows me, and he'll drop something in her heart before I even go to her. I know it, because it's happened before. But that's how you get to know people. That's the dreams. He died, he was born Christmas, I don't care if it was December 25th. I don't care about that argument. I care that he was born. I don't care what they do out there. I got a tree. I got some tinsel. I got some, I got some ornaments. I don't care about the rest. I got my Christmas music. I'm good. I don't care what they do. But he was born to die for me. To die for me. To have life in him. And more abundantly, by the way. So, Lord, if you give me wheelchair accessible vans, that will be abundant for me. And if you give me a cafe cornerstone, I'm good with that. Our future is great. I started out by saying the future is bleak for the unbeliever. But our future is great. He has great things in store for us. I want to grab a hold of them. Amen? Uh, Merry Christmas to you all. Have a blessed season. <laughs>